place too much hope on the, the kind of movement if there is again nobody if, if we are you know again just our resources and our time are so limited what, what are we doing should be really trusting solidarity that much that it's just going to be organic and emerge so I, I don't remain entirely pessimistic, but at the same, just because the, the, the family re, the family separation protests that happened in the U.S. were, I mean, in my mind, fairly precedent setting. Like, there, something has changed in immigration politics and activism. For example, you, that I saw for the first time uh, in Denver, we had a really big protest, um, a, a whole range of speakers, uh, very radical speakers, like calling for the abolition of ICE, calling for like the reunification of families, like the separation of families, and still families are separated, hundreds of families separated. Has, it's like that has really radicalized a portion of the population who were, were not previously activists, who may not have gone to like a pro-immigration rally, but there they are. I mean, there was really huge turnout uh, in Denver and across the country calling for the abolition of ICE. Like, I just, I never thought that I would see that, um, you know? And I'm, so I'm not naively hopeful, but at the same time, I feel like there's, there's more than there used to be, um, uh, a feeling of solidarity. Um, but the question is, family separation is one thing and refugees might be another. So, so my question was just about, do you think that the, uh, the kind of, I mean, maybe radicalization is too dramatic, but there's certainly a lot more public interest and knowledge about migration after the family separation. Uh, uh, there was a lot of popular demonstration. Do you think that would carry over to um, uh, people being willing to show solidarity at the border for the refugee caravan? There's a couple of things that have I have actually been talking and writing about. One is my, I guess it's it's a it's a personal dissatisfaction with the <laughs> with the narrative that we had never seen this before, that this was completely unprecedented. When for the people of the border, family separation, detention, all of this, you know, intimidation practices were part of our everyday mm -hmm. life. <laughs> but um, they were often portrayed as, oh, we had never seen anything like this before. Children had never been taken away from their families, or families had always been allowed to be together. And I think in that, in that sense, it to a degree, it simplified what was happening on the border. When again, for, for many of us, the lives of our families have been defined by family detention and separation. So I think that was that was something that had to be clarified, but that again, that all the noise you know, got pushed aside. Um, I think as somebody who has lived on the border, um, I've seen several of these waves. Whenever people turn to look at the border, Whenever there's, like a few years ago, the arrival of the company, um, um, people under the age of 18, you know, children and adolescents, young people, then we had family separations. Now we have the quote unquote caravan. Mm -hmm. and, and I think these this are waves that come and go. But we really need to come up, and this is something that we need to devise from civil society, academia, and just ordinary people. We need a long-term strategy. We cannot ourselves be just responding and to every single emergency that we have. Mm -hmm. Because after all the cameras, once all the cameras go away, right. once everybody goes back home, migrants keep coming, people keep arriving, children keep being separated from their families. Um, women keep enduring all of these horrible conditions in detention. So we need something that is more long-lasting than just responding to this coming and going crisis, because that is what we have been living with.